But there's a different way of thinking about this from a biological perspective, and that is, what makes you think the newest system is the most sophisticated one? Why don't you assume that the oldest system is the most sophisticated one? Because it's been around for, well, for example, the mechanism in, in your neurological... The mechanism that underlies your conception of your relationship to the dominance hierarchy, for example, is at least 300 million years old. And the reason it's lasted 300 million years is because it knows what it's doing. It's far older than your, the parts of your brain that make you conscious in the specifically human way. And it's so deeply embedded in your brain in some sense that you have almost no voluntary control over it. And that's why, for example, one of the things that happens to people who are depressed is that the system that reports their dominance, dominance status reports that they're low. Now, sometimes that's true because they're not depressed, they just have an awful life and they're actually at the bottom of the dominance hierarchy, and that's not the same as being depressed. But sometimes it malfunctions, so someone who's competent and well situated in life and who appears to have everything that a person could possibly desire in order to have a decent and meaningful and positive life are still catastrophically depressed. And what seems to happen in those circumstances is that the dominance counter, for one reason or another, is acting as if they're incredibly low status when they're in fact not. And I think that's a good definition of clinical depression. I also think that part of the reason that there's mixed results with regards to antidepressant trials is because antidepressants don't help you if you're at the bottom of the dominance hierarchy. Well, how could they? You're not depressed. You just have a terrible life. That is not the same thing. And they need to be carefully distinguished because if you're unemployed and you're facing the loss of your home and maybe your partner's going to leave you and your children hate you, an antidepressant is very unlikely to fix that. Now, to the degree that misbehavior on your part called, caused by impulsivity and increased aggression and decreased mood because of your reaction to that circumstance is making it worse, then the antidepressant might help you. And maybe the antidepressant will help you regain enough cognitive control so that you can plan your way out of the situation. But as a medication in and of itself, there's no possible way it can lift you out of those often catastrophically complex and disintegrating circumstances. Whereas if your life is fine but you feel terrible, well, it's much more likely that an antidepressant can help with that because in some sense what it's going to do is to readjust your dominance, the reporting of your dominance counter, so to speak, to the level that's appropriate for your level of competence, which is really what you want. You know, people say you should have high self-esteem. I, I would say idiots say that you should have high self-esteem. It's, it's an unbelievably corrupt construct in many ways because it's actually very, very highly correlated with baseline levels of neuroticism, negatively, which is a fundamental personality trait, and baseline levels of extroversion. So someone with low self-esteem is generally someone who's introverted and has high levels of negative emotion. It's a trait-like phenomena. It isn't clear at all that calling that low self-esteem has any utility whatsoever. But then you also might ask yourself, well, how much self-esteem should you have? Well, and that's a very complex question because you can clearly have way too much. That's what would make you a narcissist. So I would say your self-esteem should be roughly equivalent to the esteem in which you're held by members of your society, you know, your family and your society, because they're judging you at least in part on your competence. And you shouldn't think that you're more competent than you are, and you shouldn't think that you're less competent than you are. You should think that you're as competent as you are. And sometimes that means you're not competent at all because you don't know what you're doing, and sometimes it means that you're quite competent. Now, I think it's complicated by the fact that you should also regard yourself not only as who you are, but as who you could be. You know, and so if you're of lowly dominant status, which for example, in some sense you guys are because you're young and you know, you're starting your lives, the fact that there's a lot of potential that you still are able to manifest should tilt the self-assessment balance in your favor to a fair degree. So, anyways, Jung was very interested in 
the depths of the psyche. And he, for him, the unconscious wasn't a repository of repressed experiences. And it wasn't a repository of underdeveloped and irritated biological systems. It was instead the underlying structure of consciousness itself. So Jung believed that human experience, uh, as it's consciously manifested, was structured by underlying patterns of behavior that were specific and unique to, to, the, to the human to humankind, although shared to some degree with other animals and then on top of that a realm of imagistic and symbolic representation that in part was a consequence of representation of those underlying behaviors so here's a way of thinking about it we act in a human way whatever that means and we've been acting in a human way for as long as there's been human beings and we've been acting in a mammalian way for as long as there's been mammals now human beings are quite peculiar creatures because not only do we act we also watch ourselves act and we represent those actions and Jung believed that as a consequence of us manifesting a specific set of typically human behaviors over hundreds of thousands or perhaps millions of years we also evolved a cognitive apparatus that was capable of representing those patterns of behavior and that cognitive apparatus expressed the representations of those fundamental patterns of behavior in imagistic and symbolic form and the basic imagistic and symbolic form is something like drama now why would that be? well, it's, it's obvious in some sense what is drama? drama is the representation, the abstract representation of patterns of behavior that's what you do when you go to a movie you watch people manifest their characteristic behaviors and then you might note that there's well, there's characteristic behaviors 